Hello, welcome to another Tonalist Landscape oil painting demonstration. This is your painter in residence, M. Francis McCarthy, and the painting I'm bringing you today is called Pond at Twilight. That's not a bad title, is it? Frankly, it's more like sunset than twilight, but we'll go for it. That's fine. We've got some little sideways light going. It's got some nice colors. Uh, one of the things about this, I had the... Uh, this, this underpainting slash drawing portion you see me doing now. Um, I did that about uh, January 30th or so. In fact, I know exactly it was January 30th since I recorded the video and I put a date on it. And um, it took me till now to uh, get to uh, doing the color. I did the color uh, uh, portion yesterday and I'm real happy with the way it turned out. Um, as you probably know I've been doing a bunch of umber stuff I've been in umber mode and it's been working out good because um, I really didn't have this sort of time commitment to um, to get in and finish this or another painting you know um, a lot of times uh, on a real good day I could do the whole drawing portion and then the color portion all in one go um, I believe the uh, if you, in fact if you tip on over the members area if you remember and you can uh, have access to the live version. I think it's two hours, 20 minutes, two hours, uh, 30 minutes, something like that. It's not incredibly long, but it's a fairly simple motif. So a lot of big expanses. And you know, the more detailed, of course, uh, um, your scene is, like uh, some of the ones I've done with a bunch of rocks, and there's rocks, and there's trees, and there's a path, and that can be, you know, quite a lot more time. Um, uh, but this one went pretty pretty uh, quick and that's how I, I really want it to be to be honest I don't I ideally I think uh, a larger painting should not take an incredibly uh, greater amount of time than a smaller painting um, one of the things you want to look out for is like um, using bigger brushes right bigger brushes mean bigger strokes and not belaboring things because they're larger. Um, when I look at the immediacy that someone like uh, George Ernest could bring to his, you know, a 32 by 46 inch canvas or even larger, I haven't worked that large. I haven't worked that. Oh, there you see little Jerry, my little, um, my new little puppy. Um, you know, you've got it big. It's big in front of you. The uh, the natural impulse might be that uh, oh well, I can put some more detail in this uh, I can put extra modulations I could do this that or the other thing but um, it's good to just kind of restrain all that and keep things feeling free and feeling open you know the more you um, overwork your stuff and I'm pretty sure in the live video I talk about this quite a lot because I I have an awareness of it and I have an awareness of it because of all the I still have many of my eh, well the really bad paintings I painted over the top but there's some that are mostly good, saleable good, but I can look at them and see where I went too far. And uh, um, about uh, oh my goodness, maybe uh, eight nine years ago, I bought a uh, video series from Richard Schmid. If you don't know who he is, he's a genius. He's one of the best painters going for sure. He's got to be getting pretty old by now, but he did a series of DVDs. Um, where he did a painting session for each season. I really got to try and dig that out of the garage, but it's just so brilliant to see a man like that working. And one of the things he talked about a lot was like you could see him where his painting was at at a fresh stage, and you might see that even with my work where you're going, oh, Mike, that looks good. You know, stop. <laughs> the best thing is for you, if you're a painter, you know, to get get sh to get that own voice in your head speaking up. Stop. And uh, I definitely did that on this painting, as you see when we get into the color bit. Um, hopefully, I might have some time to get into this uh, Carlson uh, book today. I think I was, um, where was I? I marked a place. It was going really good before. It was talking about design. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so we, we'll get into that after the six, seven minute mark, halfway mark. And... Um, you can look forward to listening to some of his burbling instead of mine. But, you know, I tend to hit the same points, you know. Um, like, I deviated from this ref reference extensively. I have to say the reference was it's quite attractive the way I composited it. And um, I did do a little painting based on the same scene. 
I'm thinking 2017 or so. Uh, you have to go digging in the channel, and uh, I did make a playlist uh, by year, so uh, YouTube doesn't always make um, older things accessible, so if you want to dig into some of my, the catacombs of uh, uh, my work, even if you go back far enough, you'll see me doing a lot of the things I'm telling you not to do, overworking paintings, uh, missing compositional cues that should have been eliminated. Oh, sorry. Someone's got a very noisy engine here. Yeah, nice. Get that thing fixed, buddy. Uh, this kind of sky can be a little bit of a challenge because it was quite open, not a lot of definition. It was mostly about modulation. I did want to point out, you know, in this purpley blue tone, notice how I, I started with a little cooler, more lavender tone on one side, and as it moves across the... Um, the, the scene, um, I am modulating all the way through. I go into a little bit more of some uh, sienna tones and to where I get in the end a little burn number, a little black. So um, instead of just plopping one color, you know, say you mix a color like that. Um, I started with the color on our left. Uh, you know, you could plop that everywhere, but um, it's better to modulate. Always be modulating. ABM. Well, ABM all the way always be closing always be modulating yeah anyway let's get into some Carlson here see how far we can get so last time we were reading from this this is uh, Carlson's Guide to Landscape Painting by John F. Carlson and uh, last time we were talking about um, um, design okay uh, okay so he was talking about be quiet then um, he was talking about how one of his students had, uh, you know, was going to go after a painting of a mountain, but ended up doing a bunch of trees because the trees were, uh, he just got the better of them, took over his, his canvas. Um, so we're on page 48. This chapter's on design. And uh, he says, when beginning, get, actually, I see him doing the M. Francis grid there. Yeah on page 49 very interesting by the way if you don't have this book you can get used copies on Amazon dirt cheap just buy it it's very text heavy but uh, uh, there's some sort of nuggets in here Carlson's book is really one of the best books on landscape painting that there is anyway he says when beginning the sketch be careful how you place the first few touches or outlines of your masses you may either make or break your picture in those first few placings there's nothing so discouraging as a bad composition at the very start. Do most of your changing in composition before you begin to paint the underpainting stage, which I call the drawing stage. Um, you see you see me do that all the time. I'll erase things and move things around, simplify things. You know, that's the place to do it. Uh, ba -ba -boom, it's just a blocked in. There's nothing to spoil. After you have begun to paint, it's very difficult to ha make radical alterations in arrangement. An artist photographer once remarked to me, we have to do all our work before we snap the shutter. He meant, obviously, the arrangement, contrast, etc. Before the student begins to paint, let him draw in simply the big contour or outline of the masses with brush and paint or some and some semi-dark color. I like to use ivory black. That's the color that you see right there in the landscape portion that I haven't hit with paint yet. No, I'm just starting to. Ba -ba -bum -bum. Enlarging this mass, reducing that, changing the direction or slope of this mass and that, weighing the masses back and forth until the desired arrangement is arrived at or until the variety of relative sizes and shapes and lines not only gives the central idea its proper importance of size, but also produces a decorative and interesting design, quote unquote design. Because you've got to design your painting, don't just be thinking you're going to copy a photo and have a good painting. At best, you'll end up in a mediocre painting, and that's if you do a really good job of copying the photo. You know, if you're just don't even have that many skills and you're copying photos, um, you're guaranteed to make nothing but mediocre work. And hopefully, you'll have enough insight into yourself and your process to to, to see that. I've seen many students that uh, let's say, how can we say this? They're high on their own supply. Don't let it be you. Uh, he says, uh, don't paint, quote-unquote, direct from nature when all elements of organization, beauty, and design are palpably absent. 
Find another motif, a motif that will lend itself to pictorial ends. Nature is seldom perfect in design. The artist must look to nature for his inspiration, but, but must rearrange the elemental truths into an orderly sequence or progression of interests. By sequence is meant giving primary, secondary, or tertiary importance to such forms and color masses as are needed for an end, and leaving all others out. In speaking of composition, the use of the word need, quote-unquote need, may sound enigmatic to the beginner. Let it be understood, then, that since nature is rarely perfect in design quality, the artist, in rearranging his, quote-unquote, natural elements upon the canvas, is creating a picture. This may involve moving objects to the left or right, raising or lowering the horizon, slanting a mountain's contour in a direction opposite to that of nature, enlarging or reducing various masses, strengthening or reducing certain lines, introducing minor elements such as stones, bushes, fences, flower patches, etc. to give the desired quote, uh, uh, and he has an italics word, line, quote unquote, placing clouds in a manner to emphasize their sweep and movement to coordinate with other lines of this picture. He is really using nature and her forms while he manipulates the natural truths to suit his artistic needs. Were this not so, the man who could slavishly imitate or copy nature as he saw her would be the greatest artist. But he never is. I should say she. I should change all of his things to she because that's how we like to roll in the modern age. And that's all right. Study nature carefully. Note what is taking place upon the face of nature. Watch for the subtle transitions of color and paint these things, arranging them to best express a subjective idea. Otherwise, you might as well use a camera. So true. But, I have to say, and we'll leave it there, actually. We'll leave 49 for later. And we'll see why it has my M. Francis grid on that page. Um, yeah, I have, I personally, uh, my, my feeling is that... Um, landscape photography to do a good photograph that qualifies as quote-unquote art is really re really requires uh, a lot more work than painting because in painting we have the ability to do all these things Carlson said we can change the slope or direction we can add a lake we can add a path we can move a bush add a rock we can do whatever we're like you know God you know we're creating the world um, a photographer has to find the, uh, a, a good landscape photographer has to find the perfect motif. He has to find the best composition and vantage point for that motif. And then if he's a true artist, he has to keep coming back until he has the perfect lighting. And uh, this is one of the reasons why I tend not to um, make uh, paintings from really, really good landscape photos that are done by other people. Uh, I prefer to do my own landscape photos, which uh, as photos are not amazing, um, but they are a good recording of um, the elements of nature when I was out in nature um, that I thought I could cobble into some sort of painting. And, uh, and that's what I do, and that's what this is. And this particular scene was actually based on um, these, this place called the Perk Ponds, and these the ponds were there for uh, agricultural reasons and um, uh, you could see that little path there people would walk their dogs and do a little fishing in the pond it was very lovely I think it looks quite different now but um, uh, many of my earliest paintings were of these ponds and the scene actually wasn't one that I was able to make a painting of back then um, it wasn't until I started thinking panoramic and I had to make some pretty significant changes and I'd say before we go I have there's only a few things to add to this painting before it's done. Um, I, I'm sort of thinking I would like to fade those elements in the back, back a little more, but one of the challenges I've been looking at is the contrast against that very bright sky, so I'm sort of inclined to leave it. It would have given me a little more aerial perspective, but as it stands, I made that whole bit, uh, the whole streak of uh, landforms in the middle ground, um, much larger than they were in the reference. And this is one of the things that's giving it the pond sort of feel.
Anyway, that's it for today. I hope you got something out of this video. Tip on over my website. I got some paintings in the store there and all that. And uh, told you about the membership option. You can check that out if you want to see a live version of this painting. And anyway, I'll be back with another video for you real soon. And until that time, please do me a favor. Do me a solid. Take good care of yourself and your family, all your loved ones. Try and be patient with people. And uh, stay out of trouble.